Welcome to the Café Culture podcast, a season of discussions on culture, politics, philosophy and science. At a talk recorded on the 18th of May 2015, Richard Moss, Tony Dolphin and Katie Schmucker discussed the impact of the 2015 general election results for the North. Uh, thank you very much and thank you for that welcome. Uh, good evening everyone. It's great to see a, a full room. Um, so here's another economist come up from the south to tell you in the north what's uh, going wrong. So before I get going, perhaps I'd better just establish a few uh, northern credentials of my own. Um, so I was, I was uh, born and brought up in Grimsby, which by virtue of being in Yorkshire and Humberside just about sneaks into the official definition of the of the north. Um, my family, though, are from Hartlepool my, uh, on my father's side, so I have still have uh, relations there. My wife's from Middlesbrough and her family are still all there. And my daughter now lives in Lancashire as well. So um, I do have some uh, interest indeed in what's going on up, uh, up here in the north, as we say, uh, down in the south. Um, so I'll just talk a bit about the general economy first, then a bit about um, how things look in the northeast. And then just say something um, about the election and how that uh, might change things, particularly referencing the, the sort of this idea of a northern powerhouse and the sort of powers that might be devolved to a region like the northeast. So if you start with the, with the general economy, um, on the, on the, maybe on the three measures that people tend to look at to get a take on the economy, it's actually doing pretty well at the moment in, term, in the UK. Uh, growth last year was 2.8%, as George Osborne didn't tire of telling us in the run-up to the election. That was the fastest of any G7 economy. It was one of the fastest of any advanced economies. Um, and although growth slowed a bit in the first quarter of this year, most economists think, because largely of the low oil price, that the economy will continue to do pretty well at least through this year and into, into next. Um, on employment and unemployment, the economy has done phenomenally well over the last three years, better than any any economist um, forecast. Um, uh, again, as the government liked to tell us in the run-up to the election, over two million jobs were created in this country in the last five years, despite cuts to the uh, public sector workforce. Unemployment has fallen from a peak of 8.5% to 5.5%, despite the economic recovery not being uh, a very strong one. So on, on that side of things, things are looking very good. And on the, on the third measure that people tend to look at, inflation, again, well, their inflation's down to zero. Now, in some circumstances, a zero inflation rate would actually be a bit of a bad thing. We have an inflation target of 2%, not zero, for, for a reason. And we can go into that if people are interested in the, in the discussion session. Um, but given that this inflation fall is largely due to a fall in oil prices, and given that that affects oil producers in the Middle East and Norway, uh, not the UK economy largely now, um, you know, that fall in interest rates is also a good thing. It boosts living standards in the short term and it means interest rates will stay, uh, will stay low too. So on the face of it, the economy is doing pretty well. But underneath that, I think there are two very big challenges for the UK economy and uh, there are also challenges, I think, for the northeast economy too. The first is productivity, output per hour or output per man, um, where the level of productivity in the UK is around about 80% of the level in otherwise comparable countries like Germany, France, the Netherlands, Belgium. Which means, as The Economist put it, magazine put it recently, um, people in those countries can work Monday to Thursday and then take Friday off. We have to go into work just, and work all day through Friday just to catch up to where they got to in the, in the first four days of the, of the week. And that's a, a long-standing problem but it's been exacerbated by the fact that in the last seven years, productivity in the UK has not increased at all. And that's something that's certainly unprecedented in the post-war period when we have good records, but probably is unprecedented back to the beginning of the, of the Industrial re uh, Revolution. And what that, uh, why that's important is because it tells us something, first of all, about the nature of the jobs that have been created, um, these two million new jobs. Uh, they are, for the most part, what you might call poor jobs, very low-paid, low-productivity jobs. We're not uh, creating lots of very well-paid uh, jobs. It, it's important because productivity ultimately drives living standards. Um, you know, we all may think that companies are wicked, evil things, but you know, at the end of the day, if, 
if output per hour um, or output per worker is not increasing, then it's very difficult for them to increase, uh, to increase pay. Uh, and it's important because it affects um, how rapidly and how much, uh, how, much, how much cuts or tax increases the government has to put in case, place to cut its deficit. Um, if you think, you know, if we were uh, of the same productivity standards and levels as Germany and France, for instance, uh, then we'd all be earning 20% more, tax revenues roughly would be 20% higher, and the deficit probably wouldn't be a deficit, um, and certainly we could have a better standard of, of public services. So that productivity problem is a, is a big problem. And the second big problem is, is on trade, um, where the UK economy has run a deficit with other countries for the last 30 years, every single one of the last 30 years. And if you'd have told me 30 years ago that that was going to happen, I would have kind of laughed in your face and said, well, that's not, you know, that's not possible, it's, it's not going to happen. Other countries won't keep selling us their stuff um, um, while, we, you know, while we can't uh, sell our stuff to them. But it has happened. Um, we, are, we are pretty rubbish at exporting. We have a very narrow capabilities when it comes to exporting. We're good at cars, we're good at aeroplanes or bits of aeroplanes. Um, we're good at financial services and some other business services. But that's about it. Um, and, and, and again, it's a, it's a problem that ultimately will, will come back and bite us. So we do need to it, it both increase productivity but also to increase our, our capability when it comes to exports as a nation. And I think those problems are sort of, you know, you find those problems in the northeast as well. Um, I mean, the data in terms of you know, how the economy is doing in the short term is very, very difficult beyond the labour market to, to get a handle on how a specific region is doing. But it does look as if the northeast over the last two or three years has developed pretty much in line with the UK average. Um, certainly, unemployment has fallen here and employment has, has gone up. And, and in fact, if you look around the UK, there's no real you know, contrary to, to the belief about London leading the recovery, there's no one region or area that actually stands out as doing better. But when you drill into you know, the sort of levels of what's going on, that's where you do see that, you know, the North East has got um, specific problems. The employment rate here, the proportion of the people who are in work, is 69.3%. In the UK as a whole, it's 73.5%. The unemployment rate here is 7.5 as against that 5.5 for the UK. The inactivity rate, people who are not even trying to find work um, of working age, is 25% here, it's 22% nationally. So you've got you know, roughly 4 or 5% of, of more people nationally working uh, than are doing so in the northeast. Roughly half of those here are unemployed, half of them are, are not even trying to, to, to find work. And I think you know, the root problem is that the region is struggling uh, and other regions and areas are too, to cope with the industrialization, the effects of globalization and technological change in sort of hollowing out the economy. And if I can sort of indulge my fantasy that Grimsby's in the north a bit and think about the, the economy in Grimsby um, just a bit, you know, when I go back there now and look around the town and, and, and see you know, what, what's happening there, essentially it's a town where some people work in the food processing industry if you eat fish fingers, they're on the menu here for the kids. They almost certainly come from uh, from Grimsby, um, uh, but it, you know it processes food. But those are you know, there's a lot of very poorly paid jobs in the food processing industry in Grimsby, and just about everyone else works in industries like health or education or retailing, sort of selling things to each other or looking after each other's kids or looking after people when they're they're ill. There is no other industry, whether it be a service industry like financial services or a manufacturing industry sort of left in that region. And I think you know, if you look at the north, you know, parts of the north and the Midlands, you see the same sort of, you've seen the same sort of story. And the big challenge for, for the region, I think, is how do you get investment here that will create jobs and not just lots of minimum wage jobs like in Grimsby's food industry, but, but good jobs. And does the election make it more likely or less likely that that will happen. I think in terms of fiscal policy, so taxes and spending, it makes it less likely, that's pretty clear. Uh, the government's made it plain that it is going to continue to cut public spending at this, pretty much the same rate as it's done, did through the last um, parliament. And it's also made it clear that there's going to be extra money for health, there's going to be money for the tax cuts that David Cameron promised in the election campaign. Uh, school spending is going to be ring-fenced, development is going to be ring-fenced. So areas like vocational education and training, which is important for creating a skills space here, 
and uh, the science budget, which is important for innovation, are going to be cut quite drastically, maybe 10, 15 percent over the next uh, over the next parliament. So, th yeah, that's harder. That wouldn't have happened under a, a, if there'd been a different re election result. But I think on on what we might call industrial policy, the election probably doesn't make much difference. If we'd had a Labour government then we would probably have had a business investment bank with a regional bank in the northeast. So it might have been a bit easier to channel some finance into the, into the region. But when you think about industrial policy, by which I mean you know, policy generally on infrastructure and skills and so on, the difference between Labour and the Conservative is not the big one. The, difference is, the big difference is between the UK and other countries who are much more active in this region. And you know, the last Labour government had... Uh, 13 years to get active in industrial policy and it woke up to the thought um, when the recession hit, so after 11 of those uh, 13 years. And you can see that sort of complementarity, that sort of copycatting between Labour and Conservatives on what is now the sort of main, uh, the main focus of industrial policy, which is devolution. Um, Michael Heseltine you know, came up with a report that said it was a good idea. Andrew Adonis then for the Labour side came up with a, a report that said it's a good idea. And George Osborne is now pretty you know, intent on if, if regions want uh, devolution in, in giving it to them. Um, hence this sort of northern powerhouse phrase, which, uh, which is George Osborne's formula really for industrial re regeneration by giving regions their own sort of powers in areas like skills, infrastructure, transport, uh, welfare to work policies with even the sort of carrot being dangled that you would get some sort of welfare or tax earn backs. So if you do a really good job uh, as a region in getting people um, off uh, job seekers allowance or, or ESA into work, some of the savings from welfare might even go back to your, to your region. Um, it's a big idea. It's one he's certainly going to be pursuing for the next five years. It does come with conditions um, in terms of accountability. He's not just going to hand these powers over and say, get, get on with it, Manchester, get on with it, Leeds, get on with it, Newcastle. Um, and the accountability does seem to involve an elect. I'm not quite sure why they are so desperate to have them, but elected mayors do seem to be, to be part of, of it. So um, you know, it would be great when we get to the discussion if people can sort of give some sense of whether they think that could work either in the Newcastle as a sort of small city region or in the northeast as a whole as a sort of big region. And we can perhaps discuss you know, whether it, whether it you know, can be made to work. I think the theory of it is obviously, is obviously a very sound one. Uh, local decision makers have a much better idea of what's going on in the area and what's needed than civil servants or, or ministers sitting down in Westminster and Whitehall. Two things to think about, though, is whether that, you know, how that theory translates into, into practice. Um, how much better an idea does uh, a councillor or a mayor, elected mayor in Newcastle or Manchester have of what's needed in his region. Maybe he has a good idea of what's needed for the next year, but there's actually not much you can do about that. The kids who are going to come into the, into the workforce have already decided what courses they're doing, what apprenticeships they're on, what A-levels they're taking, what degrees they're taking. Uh, certainly when it comes to infrastructure, you need a sort of 10, 15, 20 year uh, time frame. And in my experience, most businesses don't have an idea of what their, what their demands will be uh, more than two or three years out. Um, so maybe in practice that, that's you know, not quite as strong an argument as it appears. And my second worry, my, probably my bigger worry, is that um, if you remember the movie Field of Dreams, it's a bit of a if you build it they will come sort of um, uh, approach to, to industrial policy. Um, you, you, you create a lot of skilled people, you build good roads and good infrastructure, you encourage innovation and scientific research at the university and so on. And you hope that, therefore, the investment sort of comes and, and, and creates good jobs. Um, but if I can quote The Economist for the second and final time, um, entrepreneurs don't give a fig about regional development. So you know, there's no guarantee that they will come here just because you've got a skilled workforce, just because you've got a good rail or, 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 or road network. Um, and the risk is that you just end up with lots of skilled but un still unemployed workers. And you end up with some very good roads and railways, but they're, they're, they're underused, particularly uh, by, by industry. The key challenge, as I said before, is how do you attract investment uh, that creates good jobs to, uh, to the northeast and to Newcastle in particular. Um, 
Two other thoughts just on the election. One on Scotland. Um, the election result has obviously made independence in Scotland a bit more likely again after last year's referendum rejected it. It's often presented as a threat to the northeast economy. And again, I'd be interested to hear whether you think that really is the, is the case. Just two, two thoughts from me on that. The first is that people say, well, what Scotland will do is we'll follow the example of Ireland. They'll cut tax rates, particularly corporate tax rates, to, uh, to get investment into Scotland that might otherwise have gone to the north of England or, or, or indeed elsewhere in, in Europe. My riposte to that would be, can they afford to do so? Nicola Sturgeon was very uh, cagey during the election campaign about the true health of the sort of finances of, of the Scottish economy, but certainly with the oil price where it is today, experts like the Independent for Fiscal Studies think there is a, a black hole of several billion pounds in her, her public finances. She certainly won't be wanting to cut health or education um, or charging, you know, charging students tuition fees in Scotland. So uh, where is this money coming from to, to allow her to uh, cut taxes? Because I certainly you know, don't envisage the, uh, Scotland you know, being able to, uh, to afford to do so. And the second thing is, that, is just to not forget that the big thing that really puts companies and entrepreneurs off coming, going anywhere and investing is risk and uncertainty. Um, and the idea of an independent Scotland means you know, it's going to be a very uncertain place to invest in for, for a number of years. So I guess I'm, I wouldn't worry too much about Scottish independence as a threat to, to, the, to the North East economy. I think the bigger threat is probably uh, the other the other thing that I comment on around the election, which is the EU referendum and the possibility of Britain leaving Europe. And I think that is a big worry for three reasons. First of all, it means we won't be able to access EU regional funds anymore, pretty obviously, so there'll be less money uh, um, for, for the North East in, in that instance. Secondly, it means um, yeah, it's, it's going to have a negative effect on exports. I said earlier that we're pretty rubbish at expo exporting anyway as a, as a <laughs> nation. Um, that being the case, it seems to me that one of the more stupid things you can do is actually leave the club that uh, the nations that where 50% of your exports go have, have got formed. Um, that's pretty, sending a pretty negative signal to, to them. And then thirdly, just banging on again about this thing about investment. If you're a multinational company uh, looking to invest uh, so that you can sell your product in, in Europe um, and the UK is about to quit uh, the EU, are you going to come to the UK and do that investment or are you going to go to, you know, to Prague or to, to Czech Republic or to, you know, even to Germany or, or France? So you know, I, I, it definitely makes it um, uh, less likely that multinational firms will invest in this country. And one thing people forget um, is that you know, one of the things we're very good at at the moment is making cars. Most of those cars actually that are made here end up being sold in Europe, not, not in the UK. Firms like Nissan and Toyota aren't manufacturing here just for the UK market, it's for the pan-European market. Um, so, um, just to conclude, I think there are two challenges facing the uh, North East economy. First of all, how do we create more jobs to get the employment rate up to something closer to the UK average, which would require about 4% more of the population to be, working age population to be in, in a job. And how do we boost productivity uh, so that we get not just more jobs, but better jobs, more good jobs which uh, raise people's living standards? I think there is an opportunity there for the region to sort of take into its own hands uh, meeting those two challenges because George Osborne will devolve powers if that's, what you, uh, if that's what you want. The two big unknowns and the two things that we probably ought to be talking about in the Q&A is... Is there a willingness in this region to seize those powers, to seize the, that opportunity? And then once the powers are here, will they be used wisely to bring <coughs> investment into, into the region? I wish I knew those, the answers to those questions, but instead of giving you the answers, I'm throwing them out as questions for discussion. Thank you very much. I wanted to talk a little bit this evening, um, focusing more on the sort of people side of things. Tony's talked a lot about the economy and some of the big picture stuff, and that's obviously all really, really important for what happens in terms of people's living standards and poverty rates in the UK. But I think it's not just you know, simply stopping at the idea of um, getting the economy right and the rest will follow, I think is an idea that needs to be um, challenged quite 
uh, quite strongly. And so I want to talk a little bit this evening about um, poverty in the UK in particular. Um, and when we talk about poverty at the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, what we mean by that is when individuals and families uh, don't have sufficient resources, don't have enough resources coming in to enable them to meet their basic needs. And when we talk about basic needs, what we mean is not just having enough to be able to afford a home and to be able to heat your home and to be able to eat. We also mean having enough to be able to participate in the society that you live in. So being able to do the things which are generally expected of you to be able to, uh, to engage with those around you. So it might be as basic as things like having enough money to be able to buy your children a birthday present or to enable them to go to, uh, to a friend's birthday tea. It might mean swimming lessons. It might mean um, occasionally being able to socialise with friends outside of your home. Those sorts of things we think are part of what it means to be able to not participate in society and to not be able to, uh, to sort of make ends meet and to have a standard of living that everyone in the UK should be able to expect. So in that sense, when we talk about poverty, it's quite a wide spectrum that we're talking about. We're talking about everything from utter destitution. So we've had a lot of conversation over the last five years about things like food banks in the UK and how there are more and more food banks being used. Um, that, we would argue, is at the destitution end of things. But when we talk about poverty, we're talking about a more sort of grinding, everyday struggle to make ends meet, as well as that very sort of threat to your physical life and well-being that destitution brings. So I think, as a country, we have quite a, a, an unhealthy discussion about poverty at the moment. If you just look at some of the things that are on... Uh, television regularly, whether that's Benefit Street, which has just uh, started with a new series uh, set up here, um, whether that's um, something like Channel 5's Benefits Britain, Too Fat to Work, you know, there are all these television programmes on at the moment, which are in some ways showing us something about some aspects of life in Britain, but they're not a representation of poverty, or at least they're a very, very small and partial representation of poverty, we would argue. And actually, when you look at the trends of what's been happening in uh, in poverty and the number of people who are unable to sort of make ends meet at the end of the month, what we see are some really long-term and quite difficult trends that need to be tackled and need to be challenged. Uh, so if you look at two, if you take the, the official measure of poverty, which is households who have less than 60% of the median income, so you take the middle, in, middle point on the income spectrum, 60% below that is the official measure of poverty in the UK. And if you look at who is experiencing poverty in the UK under that measure, then what you see is the changing face of poverty. It used to be the case that uh, if you were out of work, if you were older, and if you were living in social housing, these were the groups who would be experiencing poverty. Those groups still do experience poverty. But where you see the biggest rises in terms of people who are experiencing poverty, it's amongst the young, it's among th amongst those who are renting in the private sector, and it's amongst those who are working. Half of households are experiencing poverty in the UK today are households where at least one person is in work. So the face of poverty is changing, and it's a much more kind of everyday sort of um, picture than you might expect if you just watch some of the more salacious programmes on Channel 4 and Channel 5 in particular. We think that poverty is something that the UK can't afford to not tackle. If you look at the costs that are associated with people growing up in poverty, with people not having enough money to be able to make ends meet, the stress that that places on their lives, um, there are real costs associated, not just for those individuals, but also for society as a whole. We did some work a few years ago which tried to, co tried to put a cost on child poverty. So bearing in mind there's only one element of poverty, there's still working age people and pensioners after this. But child poverty alone costs the UK £29 billion a year. That's a combined cost of the lost earnings to those children in future when they grow up having not achieved their potential at school, the lost, the lost revenue to the exchequer as a result of that, the uh, additional costs to the welfare bill of having to pay benefits above and beyond what you might have otherwise had to have paid, and additional costs to public services of having to deal with the consequences of poverty, whether that's to the health service or sometimes to the criminal justice system. If you add all of those things together, it comes to £29 billion a year. We've just been through an election which, where we had a long uh, discussion about austerity in the UK and the need to live within our means and the need to bring down the UK's deficit. And I think if we're spending £29 billion a year dealing with the consequences of poverty, a very good place to start in order to do that is by tackling the causes of that poverty. 
And I think looking forward to the next parliament, what we see is a very worrying situation. The Institute for Fiscal Studies, who I think you've, you know, is a name you've probably heard quite a lot throughout this election campaign. They've been all over the airwaves um, analysing very effectively all the manifestos and the plans of the different parties. Um, they've done some work which looks not only at what poverty rates are at the moment, but also looking forward to what might happen between now and 2020. And what we see is a picture where at the moment the official poverty measures are, have been sort of fairly flat, but that's partly because average earnings and average incomes have been falling in recent years. Um, we expect to see, the, unfortunately, this doesn't help with de, uh, for the purposes of debate, but unfortunately the poverty figures always come out two years behind. But some work was done recently to try to update them to what they would be in 2015, and what we've seen is, or what we would expect to see is a rise over the next two years as a result of um, the continuing stagnation in wages, but also some of the cuts to uh, welfare and benefits beginning to come through in 2013. So the next two years, we're expecting to see poverty tick up. And what the Institute for Fiscal Studies project, with the work that they've done looking forward to 2020, is that over that period, poverty will increase further. And they project that by 2020, almost one in four adults of working age in the UK will be experiencing poverty, and almost one in three children. Now, bearing in mind that looking back over recent history, or recent decades even, the northeast of England has had a higher poverty rate than the UK average, in fact, often second only to London, which actually, despite all its prosperity, does have very high uh, poverty rates, so the highest in the country. Uh, nonetheless, given that the northeast tends to have a higher poverty rate than most other parts of the country, uh, I think we would probably expect to see that climb in poverty rates reflected here in the northeast, unfortunately, as well. And I think what's worrying about that piece of research is not simply the projection, which itself is obviously um, not the news you would hope to hear, but also that analysis was done, that calculation of future poverty rates was done before the changes that will take place during this parliament are factored in. They're not included in that calculation. So that £12 billion of welfare cuts, uh, welfare reductions that we've heard so much about during the election campaign, they're not factored into that calculation because we don't yet know where they're going to fall. And so I think when the uh, government has its budget on the 8th of July, that's going to be a really critical moment, I think, for what happens in terms of poverty in the UK in future. But I think it's important to also add that poverty isn't simply about welfare. It isn't just about the benefits budget and about um, tax rates and things like that. They're all really important, and they are among the most important policy levers for what will happen in terms of poverty. But of course, what also matters is what happens in the jobs market, what happens in housing, and also how much it costs to meet your needs. So if poverty is understood as having enough resources to be able to meet your needs, how much it costs you to heat your home, how much it costs you to feed your family, these things will also have an impact on how many people are struggling to make ends meet. So the low inflation that Tony talked about in his uh, presentation is actually very helpful in a sense, at the moment, for those who are struggling, because it does mean that the costs of those essentials aren't going up as fast as they have been of late. Although if you look back over the last uh, six, seven years to the start of the, uh, the financial crisis, we did see a period where the cost of essentials raced ahead of incomes. Uh, the cost of essentials went up about three times faster than average wages during a six-year period, and clearly during that time, a big gulf opened up between family incomes and, uh, and what people need. And so it's going to take some time for that gap to begin to close. But certainly this period of low inflation will be offering some respite to people and will certainly be a relief to those who have been struggling. So it's partly about the money that you've got coming in. And for those who are out of work, clearly the benefits uh, are a really important part of that. It's, but also what happens in the jobs market is the other thing which matters a great deal for how much income people have coming in. And I think Tony again has talked about this, I won't sort of repeat what he said, but I think there are real concerns about um, the ne what's been happening with pay and what's been happening with, uh, with the, the amount that people earn and the quality of work that a lot of people are doing. Um, I talked about uh, the changing face of poverty and how people are more likely to be in private rented housing young and in work. And it's those people who are in work, I think, is where there's a real challenge because there is a sense 
and we hear this a lot from politicians of, of all stripes, that work is the route out of poverty and work should be a route out of poverty. And absolutely that should be right. For those who are able to work, doing so should enable them to lift themselves and their families out of, out of poverty. But what we increasingly see is that work doesn't offer that route way for an increasing number of people. For some people that's about the amount that they're being paid and uh, the sort of debate around the living wage is really, really important here. But for some people, it's also about the number of hours that they're working. And those who are trapped in part-time work when they want to be working full-time, those who are on temporary or zero-hours contracts and don't know from one week to the next uh, how many hours work they're going to be getting and whether it's going to be enough for them to enable to make ends meet. Uh, these are real problems that we need to be tackling. I did just want to think forward, though, just to the, the parliament itself and what might happen over the next five years. And there's sort of three areas in particular that I wanted to just mention. One is around welfare, one is around work, and one is around some of the devolution that Tony was talking about at the end of his, uh, his remarks. Um, and I think in all of these areas, there are both threats and opportunities for the northeast of England and for people in places that are experiencing poverty as well. In terms of welfare, clearly I've already mentioned the £12 billion pounds of wealth reductions to the welfare bill. It's very difficult to see how that can be done in a way that isn't going to have an impact on some people who are experiencing poverty. Um, we'll wait to see what comes out on the 8th of July, and we'll wait to see if it does end up being £12 billion or not. But if you look at um, what's happened in the previous Parliament, the easiest way to sort of take money out of the welfare bill is by broad and shallow cuts, things like holding down the value of benefits so they don't go up as fast as the cost of living. That sort of uh, is, is the main way in which the government did, did deliver quite a lot of uh, welfare reductions in the previous parliament. So that's one option to open to them. But there have also been a lot of discussions about um, different, um, different benefits that could perhaps be means tested or perhaps taxed or different cuts that might take place for people perhaps with larger families or for younger people. So a lot of the detail is still to come there. But certainly, um, it's one that we'll be watching very closely and analysing the impact of for people and places in poverty. So that's definitely um, an area of threat. But in terms of welfare, there is also a huge area of opportunity in this parliament. Uh, and I think it's something which we've long said is the right thing to do, which is universal credit. Universal credit has the right principles behind it, trying to make it easier for and smoother for people to move in and out of work so you don't have the sort of breaks and the fragmentation that you have in the current benefits and welfare system. Um, we have some concerns about the precise design of some aspects of universal credit, but we think it's really important to hold on to the fact that the principles behind it of making it easier for people to move in and out of work and making sure people are always better off in work are absolutely the right principles. And so the continued rollout of that um, should be an improvement for a lot of people. On work, um, as we've already mentioned, there has been a very surprising um, sort of number of jobs being created in the last five years. It's taken a lot of economists by surprise, for sure. I think it's taken the government by surprise in some ways. Um, and that is undoubtedly a good thing, because the risks, to, whilst the number of people who are in work and in poverty have increased, the risk of being in poverty is substantially higher if you are out of work. So being in work reduces your risk of poverty. So undoubtedly, Work is a really important part of reducing poverty. However, um, just the numbers alone is not enough. So whilst the way in which our economy has been creating jobs is definitely an opportunity, the sort of area of threat here is around the quality of those jobs. And again, it comes back to those questions around pay, around hours, and around uh, the security of work. Finally, on devolution, I think this is going to be a really interesting area over the next five years. And I think it's very interesting the way in which George Osborne seems to be a very genuine convert to the idea of, uh, of devolution and to the cities of the north. And listening to his speech that he gave uh, recently on the topic, um, it's, it sort of feels like he himself has had something of a sort of road to Damascus type um, experience and has really sort of become a genuine convert to this. But I think... What's going to be challenging in this area is what it looks like outside of Manchester. Manchester has you know, a very long history of joint working as a city region. It has very strong relationships. It's enabled them to take some very difficult decisions, whereby you say, we will do this for the good 
of Greater Manchester as a whole, and it means individual councils sometimes having to do things which they don't directly benefit from, but they do indirectly because it's good for the, the wider area. And I think that level of sort of political maturity comes with time and it comes with relationships and it comes with developing those working relationships. Uh, and so I think for other parts of the north of England, getting into the same position where they're able to do that will be, uh, will be a challenge. And there is a risk that government will just say, well, if you can't get it together, you've missed the opportunity. And I, think, I do think devolution is an opportunity because it enables uh, local solutions to local problems to be able to be developed. So you know, the, the context of the, the labour market and the challenges that are faced in the north of England and the northeast of England in particular are quite different from other parts of the north, let alone other parts of the UK. So being able to um, develop a strategy that does bring together jobs with skills and training, with an industrial policy, that I think does hold out some uh, huge opportunity, but it has to be done in the right way, and it has to be done in a way which enables areas to have the capacity to uh, make the right decisions and to manage those decisions and deliver them effectively. And I think, turning back to the question of poverty, I do think there is potential in decentralisation, but it's not a given. I think there are a lot of people who are looking to this as a sort of solution to all our problems at the moment and I don't think that that's a foregone conclusion and certainly the research that we've done uh, looking at what the impact of devolving welfare to work systems in different parts of the world have been has shown that it can result in better, um, better de policy delivery, it can result in local solutions to local problems. However, it can also result in a much worse system whereby um, people have very differing levels of entitlement and very differing levels of service depending on where they live and that sort of postcode lottery concern that some people have about devolution. And I think that what it shows us is that these things can be positive, but there has to be a political will to make them so. And I think that's the real sort of thing that I, th that I think will be really interesting and really challenging about the next five years, is whether the decentralisation agenda is able to genuinely begin to join up economic growth on the one hand, which has been where a lot of the city regional agenda has come from, a desire to, uh, to grow local economies, whether that can be joined up with reducing poverty. And it's only if you can bring those two things together, I think, will the agenda actually really work. And to make that happen, I think um, being able to design training and skills more locally will be important. But I also think some of the industrial policies that Tony was talking about, they need to um, look a bit different in different parts of the country. And I think there is a tendency for people to hear industrial policy and to think about high value, high value added um, sort of engineering and manufacturing of the sort of top, at the top end and very high skilled jobs. Those things are all really important and should be part of an industrial strategy. But what I'd like to see is an industrial strategy that also thinks about, well, how do you improve productivity in some of those mass employing, low paid, low skilled sectors? sectors like retail, like care services. They, you know, these are the places where a lot of the people who are experiencing poverty despite being in work are working. So how can we drive up productivity in those areas and as a result drive up pay and the quality of work as well? Um, so I shall leave it on that slight note of optimism, but I'm very interested to hear what people have to say. Capiculture North East is supported by Newcastle University, Peels and the British Science Association. We're also supported by Ginger's Cafe in Dunn City, who host the events.